Okay, this is our video for section 5.2. And just as a heads up, 5.2 will have a My Math Lab assignment as well as a worksheet. So make sure you have um, that worksheet uh, printed out um, so you don't forget to do it, okay? All right, so again, just like the last several sections we've covered, we're starting off with just remembering these identities, right? We wanna know them like the front of our face or the back of our hand. So we're gonna go ahead and quickly fill these in. If you can do it faster than I can write, that's totally fine, fill them all in. Um, and follow along when you get done. So cotangent is the inverse of tangent. So we can also write tangent theta as one over cotangent theta. Secant is the inverse of cosine, right? So we can write that as one over cosine theta. Cosine we can write as one over secant theta. Cosecant and sine are inverses. So I can write uh, cosecant theta as one over sine theta and I can write sine theta as one over cosecant theta, okay? All right, so hopefully the reciprocal identities are nothing that are gonna hang you up. I'm gonna skip the Pythagorean ones for a minute just because these other ones are really easy um, to quickly fill in. So sine of negative theta is the same thing as negative sine theta, right? Sines change signs, <laughs> right? Which means that cosecant also changes sine. So negative cosecant um, uh, theta is the same as cosecant of a negative angle, okay? Cosine, whether we deal with a negative or positive angle, um, the, the cosine value itself stays the same. So cosine of negative theta equals cosine theta. Secant, because it's related to cosine, right, also stays positive. So this is just secant theta. And then tangent changes signs along with sine. So tangent of a negative theta gives us a negative tangent theta. And cotangent of a negative angle is a negative cotangent value of the positive angle. Okay. And then our quotient identities is just writing tangent and cotangent in terms of sine and cosine. So tangent, remember it's y over x, which is our sine theta over our cosine theta. And our cotangent is cosine theta over sine theta, okay? So hopefully the reciprocal identities at the top of the page, um, the negative identities and the quotient identities are all identities that you can crank out relatively quickly, right? Um, the Pythagorean identities, we've come up with little shortcut ways of remembering them, right? You sin, you confess, you're one with God. So sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to one. And remember, we can solve this and get two additional identities off of it, right? We can solve it just for sine theta. So we could take sine squared theta, and that means that it would equal what? If I solve this for sine squared theta, I would move my cosine squared theta to the other side by subtracting. So that would give me one minus cosine squared theta, right? So we talked about being able to um, solve these so that we can interchangeably replace them, right? And modify whatever it is we're working with. But we also talked about how we could factor this as a difference of squares. So we could replace sine squared theta with one minus cosine squared theta, or we could take it a step further and actually factor this down, right? We could also write this as sine squared theta is equal to one plus cosine theta times one minus cosine theta. Right, y'all remember doing this a couple days ago? So that's if we take this first um, identity and solve it for sine squared, we could also take the first identity and solve it for cosine squared. Right, we could say cosine squared theta is the same as, well, isolating cosine means we have to move the sine squared theta to the other side. So that would give us one minus sine squared theta. And then, <clears throat> same as we did with the sine squared, this actually is a difference of squares. So we could go a step further, right? So cosine squared theta is equal to one plus sine theta, one minus sine theta. Okay, so these are going to come in handy. This came from this identity. 
and this one also came from this identity. So we did a couple yesterday where we would replace uh, sine squared plus cosine squared. I think we might have even had a couple on the homework where you had to solve it for one or the other and, and replace one minus cosine squared with a sine squared or a one minus sine squared with a cosine squared. But today we're gonna we're gonna go over some where we're gonna be seeing this this other simplified version. So if you see like a one minus cosine or a one plus cosine or a one plus sine or one minus sine, knowing that we could do something to it to modify it, that if we could get both of those quantities, we would know that they multiply to give us this uh, different squares expression, which then we can replace with cosine squared theta okay so I just want to quickly go over the other ones that we got from these other ones um, our second Pythagorean identity is 1 tan second right so 1 plus tangent squared theta is equal to secant squared theta and I can do the same thing I did with the first identity and I can solve this um, just for uh, tangent or just for secant or I could even just solve it for the one right if I were to solve this for one Let's go up here and I have 1 is equal to I could move that tangent squared theta to the other side by subtracting right so this gives me secant squared theta minus tangent squared theta so in this case solving it for the 1 actually gives us a perfect difference of squares so we could also say that 1 is equal to secant theta plus tangent theta times secant theta minus tangent theta okay so that was solving it for the one it's already solved for the secant squared and I can't I can't change this side into a difference of squares because they're not being subtracted but I could also solve it for tangent squared right so tangent squared theta if I got the tangent all by itself I would have to subtract the one so that would give me secant squared theta equals one or sorry minus one not equals minus one so this is an identity we could use or we could break the right hand side down into a difference of squares and say that tangent squared theta is also equal to secant theta plus one and secant theta minus one right and then our last one we can get two identities off of it as well so our lesson was one cocos, right? And it's one plus cotangent squared theta is equal to cosecant squared theta. So there's two things I could isolate. I could either isolate the one or I could isolate the cotangent squared theta. So if I isolate the one, I would get one is equal to the cosecant squared theta. And then I would have to move that cotangent to the other side by subtracting cotangent squared theta right and then this is a difference of squares so I could break it down further and say one is equal to cosecant theta plus cotangent theta times cosecant theta minus oh my gosh I can't say what I'm writing cotangent theta okay sorry that's a little messy and then we could also um, solve it for cotangent right so if I did cotangent squared theta, we could move the one to the other side and get um, cosecant squared theta minus one, right? Which again is a difference of squares. So we could also write this as um, cosecant theta plus one and cosecant theta minus one, okay? All right, so I know that seemed like a lot, but really I'm just taking these three properties and seeing how all well I can solve them, right? So again, if we are given something that is sine and cosine, we know we're going to be using this, right? Or it could be something that has to do with their inverses, right? It could be um, cosecant and cosine, or it could be sine and uh, secant, right? Um, and so then we look at the variety of ways we can use um, that one property and the same thing with these if we have tangent and secant or maybe tangent and cosine or maybe cotangent and secant we're looking at this uh, Pythagorean identity and we're looking at the variations of how we can 
um, break that one down or build it up, right, to be able to replace it with something. So all of these we need to know like super well, okay? So if we can come up with these middle ones, if we can just remember these Pythagorean identities, we should be able to figure out all the others just by kind of manipulating them, okay? All right, so here's our strategy. What we're gonna look at now is verifying identities. Now, when you see the word verifying, that means we're trying to prove that the statement is true. And we can't just say, you know, yeah, I agree. <laughs> there has to be some type of logical way we can say, this is the same thing as this, okay? So when we work on these more complicated um, identities, we need to really, really know the basic identities from the last page, okay? So that we can, if we have those memorized, right, we can easily recall, oh, I can replace this with this to eventually make the statement true, okay? And there's not a specific step. I know I've listed steps, but notice I called them things to try, not necessarily steps, because there's not specific step, steps to solve each of these, um, because they can be worked in a variety of ways. But um, we are going to list some steps here um, that are good to try that might help us get to our goal, okay? So we have two ways that we can work these problems. I'm going to call this the game plan, okay? When we're doing the game plan, we have two ways of doing it. The first way is that we can start with, like, one side and try to manipulate it to look like the other side. So maybe we start with um, the right side or the left side. We'll just say left side. And um, we try to make it look like the right side, right? Or rewriting it, rewriting and work towards right side, if that makes sense. So we start with the left side and we say, oh, we could rewrite this left side to look like this. And then we could rewrite that to look like this. And then we could rewrite that to look like this. And eventually we manipulate it enough that it ends up looking like the right side. Okay. And now I chose left side, right side, but it doesn't matter which one you start with. You could start with the left and move to the right, or you could start with the right side, try to make it look like the left side. Okay. So that's one way of doing it is to start with one side and try to force it to look like the other side. The other strategy is you can work with both sides simultaneously and try to modify both of them to where they eventually look the same, okay? So on this one, we would start with both sides individually and separately make them look the same. Now notice, I'm going to underline this word separately. If we work with both sides individually, if I want to show that this is equal to this, then all I can do is modify each one and eventually say, okay, so this obviously equals this. I can't take stuff from this side and move it to that side. Because remember, we can only move things across the equal sign if we are ensured that that is a true equal statement, which we can't in this case because we're trying to prove that it's a true and equal statement, okay? So if you use the second um, game plan here, then make sure you keep the left side on the left and the right side on the right, and you just work each side individually but separately to show that they will eventually equal the same thing, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and look at some. Now, I'm gonna just go ahead and, and say this. I was working through these notes earlier and realized there's really not a lot of writing space. So if you like to write in a lot of little notes to yourself, um, so you remember how we were doing these things, or if you tend to write big, I would suggest maybe even working these on a separate sheet of paper and just sticking them with your notes. Um, and actually on one of the problems, I'm gonna add some scratch paper to it so I don't have to write so small and squinch it in there, okay? This one's not bad, but further on, they're not great. So <laughs> if you were waiting to watch this video before you printed notes or whatever, um, you, this is something that you can easily work on notebook paper, okay? All right. So we want to verify that the following equations 
um, are an identity. So verify, we want to think we're proving it. Okay. All right. So on this one, um, I, I would choose to start with the left side because one is so we could go a million places starting at one, right? A lot of those identities from the last page, we had a bunch that like this one equals one, these two we could solve for one. Like there's so many ways to go with one that it's overwhelming. So I'm going to start with the side that actually has um, trig values because then maybe I can manipulate or, or substitute in for them. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of talk through these and then we'll see which one helps us in this case. So number one is learn the fundamental identities. That's everything from the last page, which we have that to reference right now. Number two, try to rewrite the more complicated side. So obviously that's this left side. And make sure you tell me, um, because the worksheet that, that goes along with this section, this is exactly what it is. It is verifying. So I'm looking for a step-by-step -step proof. So on this one, we're going to start with the left side. And we want to eventually make it look like um, the right side, right? So the left side, I guess I should have done it like this, is cotangent x, secant x, sine x. So we're multiplying those three things, okay? All right, so hopefully we can manipulate this down and say, oh, look, it eventually looks just like the right side. Or in other words, it just equals one, okay? So the third thing says, try expressing all trig functions in the same equation in terms of sine and cosine. So that might actually help us here, right? So let's go ahead and write these with sine and cosine. Cotangent is the inverse of tangent, right? So instead of having sine over cosine, cotangent flips it. So cotangent is the same as cosine x over sine x. Right? And I'm going to use parentheses just because all these little x's, I hate it when they use x. I wish we used thetas all the time or betas or alphas or something that doesn't look like a, just a regular letter. All right, secant is um, also something we can rewrite with sine and cosine, right? Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So I could write this as 1 over cosine x, right? And then sine x is already written as sine x. We could write it as sine x over 1 if you wanted them to all be written with um, sine and cosine. So now it's pretty easy to see that we have it written like this, right? Our cosine x's are going to cancel, and our sine x's are going to cancel. And what we're left with is 1 over 1, which is just 1, right? Which is the right side. Right side. Okay. So you can do right side and you can put a check mark, you can put an exclamation point. Um, usually in math when we prove things, we'll put like a little box with a check in it saying we have verified it. Okay. All right, so let's look at one that's a little bit more challenging. And actually before we do, I'm going to look at these other steps. So that's really all we had to do was write everything in terms of sine and cosine and we were able to manipulate it so it looks like the right side. But had that not worked, some other things we can try is to perform... Um, indicated factoring or algebraic operations. So if it looks like we have stuff that's being multiplied together, maybe we FOIL it all out, right? Or um, if we have something that looks like a piece of a difference of squares or something that has been factored, maybe we can manipulate it that way, okay? Um, number five, remember the formula for which you are aiming, okay? So it's always a good idea to just keep in the back of your mind where you're headed, where you want to go, what you're trying to replace things with, um, and then this is a really, really good hint. Anytime you see a 1 plus sine x or a 1 minus sine x or 1 plus cosine x or a 1 minus cosine x, um, that should be triggering your brain to think that we probably went to this extreme of breaking down a difference of squares. So if you just see a 1 plus cosine x, I want to see if there's an opportunity to maybe multiply that by a 1 minus cosine x. Because then when we multiply these together, eventually I can replace it with a squared term, okay? Or the same thing if I see a secant theta plus tangent theta, I would like to eventually be able to multiply that by secant minus tangent theta because when I know all that's multiplied out, it's going to give me this, which I can then just replace with 1, okay? All right, so let's just keep that in mind and move on to our next example.
So this one says cotangent squared theta um, times tangent squared theta plus 1 equals cosecant squared theta. Now again, we always want to start with a more complicated side because that usually allows us to have something to work with, right? Here, there's a lot of places we could go with just a single term, right? I could change that to a reciprocal. I could use a Pythagorean identity to remove it. There's a whole lot I could do. But I'm going to go ahead and start with this side, okay? So first thing I'm going to do is make a note that I'm starting with the left side, which is cotangent squared theta times tangent squared theta plus 1, okay? All right, now I'm going to actually work this one two different ways because there's a lot of different ways we can be working these and I don't want you to get discouraged if, if you looked at it and you're like, ooh, we could just do this right away, right? So one of our strategies is to be able to manipulate these things by changing them all to sine and cosine, right? So I'm going to go ahead and work it that way first because that's something we've seen before is um, let's change all of this to sine and cosine. So cotangent is cosine over sine. So I could, excuse me, write this as cosine squared theta over sine squared theta, right? And then in my parentheses, tangent is sine over cosine. So I could write this as sine squared theta over cosine squared theta plus one, okay? And really that didn't give me anything that canceled out. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and perform the operation. So when we have something that's written right up against parentheses, that means we're multiplying, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just distribute this term into both of those terms. So when we multiply fractions, remember we multiply straight across. So this first one, when I distribute to my first term, I'm going to get cosine squared theta, sine squared theta over sine squared theta, cosine squared theta. And then when I distribute um, cosine over sine squared to the one, I'm just gonna get cosine squared theta over sine squared theta, right? And notice this first term, everything cancels out. Now remember, when everything cancels out, it doesn't become zero right? When we cancel a number over itself or a quantity over itself or a trig function over itself, that's a form of one, right? So when all this stuff cancels out, this whole term just becomes a one plus cosine squared theta over sine squared theta, okay? And remember, let's stop for a minute and look at what we were aiming towards. We were aiming towards cosecant squared, Okay, so I'm going to look at my formula really quick and look for cosecant squared. So when I look for cosecant squared, cosecant squared, here's, my, here's where I have a cosecant squared, right? So cosecant squared, I could replace um, with a 1 plus cotangent squared, right? So if I could make what I have look like 1 plus cotangent squared, then I would arrive at my answer. So I need to see, I know I have the plus 1, but I want to see if my other quantity looks like cotangent squared. Okay. So if I look at mine, notice I have 1 plus cosine over sine. Cosine over sine is cotangent, and they're both squared. So this means I can replace this with cotangent squared theta. Right, And now I can go ahead and say that equals the right-hand side because we know 1 plus cotangent squared theta equals cosecant squared theta. Right, That's our one cocos <laughs> property. So we know that this is equal to cosecant squared theta, which is our right side. So we can go ahead and put our little box and say, yay, we solved it. Right? Okay, so that's one way to do this problem. I want to show you another way. Okay, another way, again, I'm still going to start with the left side, which is cotangent squared theta times tangent squared theta plus 1. Right? Now, what we may have noticed right away is that before we started jumping into replacing everything with sine and cosines is that we already had a squared 
uh, term plus one. We had a tangent squared plus one. So what I want to do is I want to look back at my formula sheet and see if we have something that has a tangent squared theta plus one. So I'm going to look at these Pythagorean identities and notice this middle one, I have a tangent squared theta plus one. So tangent squared theta plus one, I can replace that whole thing with secant squared theta. So I'm going to go ahead and replace this whole thing with secant squared theta. So now I have cotangent squared theta times secant squared theta. And now that I've replaced that, that um, quantity, now I can go ahead and write these with sines and cosines. So cotangent, we know, is cosine squared theta over sine squared theta. And we know that secant is the inverse of cosine. So that's 1 over cosine squared theta. And notice here, my cosines will cancel, right? So what I'm left with is a 1 on top and a sine squared theta. And 1 over sine squared theta is exactly what we're working towards, right? Because the inverse of sine is cosecant. So we can say this is the same thing as cosecant squared theta, which is in fact our right side. So again, we've solved it. Okay. So just know when you're working through these, there's a variety of ways to solve it. You just have to look for what makes sense to you. Some people look at this and they're like, oh my gosh, this is way too many sines and cosines. I want to see if I can just replace things like as is um, and only revert to, you know, replacing things with sines and cosines when I can't go any further. Okay. Just make sure you show me all your steps. Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at another one. Now this one, no, I think this one where we should have plenty of writing space. This is another one that I, that I'm going to write. Um, let's see, let's look at it. We have tangent squared S and secant squared S is equal to one plus cosine S and one minus cosine S. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this is one actually that I think it might be easier to work both sides and then just show that they're equal. Because this right here to me, this kind of looks like a factored difference of squares, right? So I want to see what, what difference of squares value would I have had this not been factored. So a one plus cosine times one minus cosine, right? So if I look back, and I could actually, I'll go ahead and, and multiply these out. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna write the left side here, which is tangent squared S over secant squared S. And then I'm gonna write the right side over here, right side. And I'm gonna see if I can get, um, if I can get both sides to look the same. So on the right side, I have one plus cosine S and one minus cosine S, right? So <clears throat> I wanna go ahead and look at what would I get if I distributed this all out, right? If I went ahead and distributed, one times one is one, right? One times negative cosine S is negative cosine S. Cosine S times 1 is a positive cosine S. And cosine S times negative cosine S is a negative cosine squared S. Okay. All right. And notice my middle terms are opposites. They're exactly the same, but the signs are opposite. So those combine to 0. So I'm left with 1 minus cosine squared S. Okay. All right. So now I have a 1 and I have a squared term, I'm thinking this should be one of my Pythagorean identities. So I need a 1 and I need a negative cosine squared. So if I look at my um, Pythagorean properties here, where I end up with a cosine squared is this first one, right? 
and notice if it's solved for sine squared, I get one minus cosine squared, which is exactly what I have right now. Actually, what I started with was, was this. So if you would have noticed that from the very beginning, you wouldn't even have had to foil those out. We could go ahead and just replace those with sine squared. But we went ahead and multiplied ours, right? And so now we're here. So we have this, which again, we can still say is the same thing as sine squared. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace this with sine squared theta, okay? All right, now that looks pretty good. I mean, I'm down to like one little trig term. So I'm gonna stop with the right side and I'm gonna see if I can make this side look like sine squared, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and write this out. Um, let's see, what can I do to write this out? Tangent and secant. I'd really like to write those individually. So what I'm going to do is instead of writing tangent over secant squared, I'm going to write this as tangent squared S times 1 over secant squared S. Does that make sense? Because if we divide these, I could, I could take that division out and write it as 1 over secant. And I just want to write them individually like that so then I can write them both in terms of sine and cosine, right? Because if I write sine and cosine here, I'm going to end up with a fraction and a fraction. I'm going to have to flip and multiply and do a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and just eliminate that by um, writing this division as the multiplication of a reciprocal. Okay. All right. So now tangent, if I write it in terms of sine and cosine, tangent squared S is sine over cosine. So I could write this side as sine squared S over cosine squared s, right? And then this one is a reciprocal, right? The reciprocal of secant is cosine s. So I could write this as just a regular cosine squared s, right? Or I could write it over one if that helps. And now you can see that we have a cosine squared on top and bottom. So when I cancel those, I'm left with sine squared s. And then notice here, that's exactly what I got on the other side. So this is now equal to the right side. And this is now equal to the left side. So I'm going to go ahead and put my box and say that I have proved it. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? Um, it is possible. Let's say we hadn't worked both sides. Let's say we just started with the left side. When I work this all the way down to sine squared s, um, sine squared of s, here I could then use the Pythagorean theorem that lets me go from this to the right hand side, okay? And that would have proved it as well. In this case, I just wanted to work both so that we could end up with the same thing. But if you started with this side and got to sine squared and then said, okay, this is now equal to that by the Pythagorean theorem, I'm fine with that too, okay? All right, so all of these maybe weren't too, too bad. I want to look at some where we actually have those quantities um, where we can multiply by the other piece to end up with what we need. And what I mean by that is anytime we see these pieces right here, like um, uh, 1 plus cosine theta or 1 minus cosine theta, I would like to have both pieces because both pieces multiplied together means I can replace it with one nice little trig term. Okay, same thing if you see one plus sine theta or one minus sine theta. I want both pieces so that I can replace it with a nice trig term. And that goes for all of these. So anytime you see any of these difference of squares quantities, but you only see one of them, what we would like to do is be able to multiply by the other one, excuse me, um, to ensure that we can then replace it with something nice and pretty. So we can replace it with one nice little trig term, or we can replace it with one nice little number one, okay? All right, so oof, looking at this one, this one is secant s plus tangent s over sine s <laughs> is equal to cosecant s over secant s minus tangent s. We're using our s's again. Actually, I'm just going to change oh, I'm just going to change these to thetas. Since since this part of your assignment is a worksheet, 
honestly, if I can see that you worked it out, I'm not really concerned with how the thing is labeled. So I'm just going to replace all of those with thetas. So it's a little bit easier to um, write. Okay. All right. Now notice I'm seeing secant and tangent, secant and tangent, right? There's a positive addition term and then there's a subtraction. So right away I'm like, Ooh, I would like for that to, you know, maybe have both of those written together. Cause if I look back over at my identities here, if I look back over at my identities here, if I can have a secant theta plus tangent theta being multiplied by a secant theta minus tangent theta, that whole mess I could just replace with a one. Okay. So what I need to determine is, do I want to start with this side or do I want to start with this side? And honestly, you'll get the same answer no matter what, but a lot of times a complicated numerator is a little bit easier to work with than a complicated denominator. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and write that. A complicated, complicated numerator is usually easier um, than a complicated denominator. Okay, so <clears throat> choosing which one I want to manipulate, I'm probably going to start with this left-hand side because I'd rather the big nasty thing on top versus having a big nasty thing on bottom, right? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the left side. The left side is secant theta plus tangent theta all over sine theta. Okay. Now, just like I said before, I have half of that quantity that I want, right? I have a secant theta plus tangent theta. So I have this one. So what I need is the secant theta minus tangent theta. But I can't just multiply it on because that would change the value, right? The only thing that doesn't change the value is if I multiply by one, right? If I can just multiply by one, then my my um, expression isn't changing its value, right? So instead of multiplying just the top by secant theta minus tangent theta, I'm going to multiply on top and bottom because if I can multiply by a form of one, then I'm not changing the value of my expression. Or in other words, I'm going to multiply by secant theta minus tangent theta over secant theta minus tangent theta. So notice here, I'm just multiplying by, this is, this equals one, right? Because I have the same thing over itself. So this whole thing is one. So as long as I'm multiplying by a form of one, it's totally okay. And the reason that I'm wanting to do that, right, is because when I multiply these together on top, I will now have secant theta plus tangent theta and secant theta minus tangent theta, which is that difference of squares uh, value that I needed, right? And on bottom, I would have sine theta times secant theta minus tangent theta. Okay. All right. So now that I have those difference of squares quantities that I was working towards, we can now replace it with what that equals. So notice we got that one from this second uh, Pythagorean property, which says secant theta plus tangent theta times secant theta minus tangent theta, that whole mess just equals one. So I'm going to go ahead and just replace this whole top part with a one. So I have one over sine theta times secant theta minus tangent theta. Okay. All right, so let's look at what we have and let's look at where we're going, okay? So here's what we have and where we're going is we want to end up with this. So if I look at the right-hand side, on bottom I need a secant theta minus tangent theta, which notice I already have a secant theta minus tangent theta, right? This bottom is already what I need. The only difference is I need a cosecant theta on top and over here, I have a sine theta on bottom, 
So what I can do is I can, I can separate this into a multiplication. I can say this is the same thing as 1 over sine theta times 1 over secant theta minus tangent theta. Do you agree? Right? These are just separate factors. So I can write this as two separate factors being multiplied here in the denominator. So this gives me the denominator that I want. And sine theta, I can get to look like cosecant theta by doing the reciprocal identity, right? The reciprocal of sine theta is cosecant theta. And because sine was in the denominator, when I do that reciprocal identity, my cosecant theta is going to be in the numerator. So now if I just multiply straight across here, this gives me cosecant theta all over secant theta minus tangent theta, which is in fact the right side of my, um, of my equation, okay? All right, so I want to look at another one. This is the one that if you tend to write big, you might want to do this on a separate sheet of paper um, just because there's a lot of steps and I like to write out what I'm doing at each step. So let's go ahead and look at number five down here. Number five says um, cotangent theta minus cosecant theta over cotangent theta plus cosecant theta is equal to one minus cosine theta plus cosine theta squared all over negative sine squared theta. Ugh, right? <laughs> so the first thing that stands out to me, the first thing that stands out to me is that these quantities look exactly the same other than the sign in the middle, right? Which makes me think that I probably want those difference of squares quantities like we did on number four, right? So I'm going to look at my identity page and I'm going to look for, do we have one that has cotangent and cosecant, right? Cotangent and cosecant. So if I look over here, I do have one that has cotangent and cosecant, right? So I want to try to get those two quantities together because if I can get those two quantities together being multiplied, then I can replace the whole thing with just one, okay? So I need a cosecant theta plus cotangent theta, and I need a cosecant theta minus cotangent theta. So let's go ahead and look at what we have. Now, we can choose if we want to get rid of the denominator or if we want to get rid of the numerator, right? So I'm going to go ahead and start with the left side, which is cotangent theta minus cosecant theta over cotangent theta plus cosecant theta. Okay. And what I would personally do, since I know wherever I create these two quantities being multiplied together, I'm going to end up with a 1. I'm going to get rid of the one that's in the denominator because messy denominators are not fun to work with. So if I want this one to be one of my quantities, right, I want this one to be one of my quantities, then the quantity that I need it to be multiplied by, right, is the exact quantity but with the opposite sign. So I need a cotangent theta minus cosecant theta. And I can only do this if I multiply by a form of 1. So whatever I multiply by on the bottom has to be the same thing that I multiply by on the top. So cotangent theta minus cosecant theta. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and multiply this out on top and bottom. Okay. So on top, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and write another step over here before I come down, just because I know this one takes a lot of steps. So on top, when I do cotangent times cotangent, I'm going to get a cotangent squared theta. Cotangent times negative cosecant is going to be a negative cotangent theta, cosecant theta. Negative cosecant times cotangent is a negative cotangent theta, cosecant theta. And then negative cosecant times negative cosecant is a negative cosecant squared theta. Okay. So that's what we get on top. 
on bottom, we should get a perfect squared quantity, right? But I'm going to go ahead and multiply it out just to make sure. So cotangent times cotangent gives me cotangent squared theta. Cotangent times negative cosecant is a negative cotangent theta, cosecant theta. And then I move on to my next term. Cosecant times cotangent is a positive cotangent theta, cosecant theta. And then I have cosecant times negative cosecant, which is a negative cosecant squared theta. Okay, so of course my two terms do cancel out on the bottom. On the top, these are the same, so I can actually combine them. Right, so let's just go ahead and write the simplified uh, version here. So I have cotangent squared theta minus 2 cotangent theta cosecant theta minus uh, cosecant theta squared on top. And on bottom, I have cotangent squared theta minus cosecant squared theta. Okay. So all we did was multiply on top and bottom by the quantity that would allow us to have a perfect difference of squares on bottom. Okay, so I just want to double check my, my um, identities that this is something that um, can simplify, right? It should come out nice. So the identity that we were looking at here was the one with cosecant and cotangent. Oops, let me scoot this up. The one that we were looking at was the one with cosecant and cotangent, right? So we got those uh, um, quantities and we distributed it out. So what we're working towards is this one, which says that cosecant squared minus cotangent squared gives us one. But if I look at what we're working towards here and what I actually have, I have a little bit of a discrepancy, right? Because even though I have the right squared terms, their signs aren't right. I need a positive cosecant squared, and I have a negative one. And I need a negative cotangent squared, and I have a positive one. So I can't replace this with one, right, unless my signs are the same. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to factor out the negative, okay? I'm going to factor out the negative. So I'm going to keep the top the same, cotangent squared theta minus 2 cotangent theta cosecant theta minus cosecant squared theta. And on bottom, if I just factor out a negative 1, then that's going to change the signs here, right? That's going to make this a negative cotangent squared theta and a positive cosecant squared theta, right? So then if I double check, now what I was what I was working towards was a negative cotangent squared, which I now have, right? And a positive cosecant squared, which I now have. So now I can go ahead and replace this whole thing with just a positive one, right? Because that's what our identity says that this equals. So it's a little extra work, right, because the signs were off, but we were still able to get um, the bulk of that done. Okay, so let's go ahead and write what we have. We now have, um, we now have cotangent squared theta minus 2 cotangent theta cosecant theta minus cosecant squared theta all over negative 1, right? Okay, so we're going to stop for just a second and look at what we're working towards. So we started with the left side, so we're working towards the right side. And right now, what we need to end up with the right side, we just did some simplifying in the denominator. In the denominator, we're left with a negative, which we do want a negative in the denominator, right? But we also want a sine squared in the denominator, which I am not seeing how we could get a sine squared in the denominator at this point, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply by what we need. But again, I can't multiply by just some random thing. I would have to multiply by a value over itself, right? A value over itself. So if I want to end up with a sine squared theta, 
down in the denominator, what I can do is I can just multiply on top and bottom by a sine squared theta. Because sine squared theta over sine squared theta is just one, so I'm just multiplying by a form of one, but that will allow my denominator to look the way it needs to, and then hopefully when I distribute this sine squared theta to every term, it will simplify down to what I'm needing, okay? All right, so I'm gonna do two things. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, multiply this times the negative one on bottom, but because I know this is gonna have some massive simplifying that needs to happen, I'm gonna go ahead and also write all of these things in terms of sine and cosine. So hopefully I can simplify easily. So cotangent, cotangent is cosine over sine. So I could write that as cosine squared theta over sine squared theta, right? And I'm multiplying that by this sine squared theta. Sine squared theta. So that was the first term. Now the second term, I have a negative two. Cotangent is cosine over sine. So I'm gonna write this as cosine theta over sine theta. Okay, so just replacing that cotangent. Then I have cosecant. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So I'm gonna write that as one over sine theta. And then I'm also multiplying it by this sine squared theta. Okay, all right, so that was my second term. Third term, I have a negative cosecant squared. Cosecant squared is the reciprocal of sine squared. So I could write this as one over sine squared theta and then I'm multiplying it by sine squared theta, okay? So all I did is just rewrite the whole top piece. I wrote each piece in terms of sine and cosine, and then I went ahead and distributed this sine squared theta to all the pieces. And then on bottom, I end up with negative sine squared theta, right? Just multiplying the negative one and the sine squared. So now what I should be able to do is to simplify this down to what I need, okay? So if I look at this first piece, this first piece, my sine squareds cancel, right? And I'm just going to be left with cosine squared theta. My second piece, I have a sine theta and a sine theta. So if I multiply those together, sine theta times sine theta is sine squared theta, and those are gonna cancel with the sine squared theta that I multiplied by. So notice this middle term now just has a negative two cosine theta. And then my very last term, my sine squared thetas cancel, and I'm just left with a negative one. All over negative sine squared theta. All right, so let's make sure we ended up with what we wanna end up with, okay? So on bottom, we have our negative sine squared theta, which is what we want. On top, we need a cosine squared theta, which I have. We need a negative two cosine theta, which I have. And we need a positive one, which I have, mm, I have a negative one. All right, let's see what we did. So, we need this to be a positive one. So let's see if I made a boo-boo. So this negative one came from this term, which used to be 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 this term. Okay, so we got that by foiling out these top two pieces. Oh, yep, it is my, my mistake. Because if we do a negative cosecant theta times a negative cosecant theta, right? A negative times a negative should have made this a positive cosecant squared theta. That's my mistake. So all these cosecant squared thetas at the top, or the last term of the top, should be positive. Which would make this one positive. Which would make this one positive which means we would be left with a positive one here, okay?
Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay, so we ended up with what the right side is. So we are done proving this. Check. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, I have three more to work through and I feel like they're kind of just more of the same. This was probably like the worst one. <laughs> so if you've survived this, hopefully from here on out, we have smooth sailings. So let's look at a couple more. On this one, <clears throat> we're starting off with um, probably the left side, right? Because if you notice here, we see these quantities that are so identical except for that middle sign that we should be thinking, okay, we need to have that other, um, that other quantity. Now, instead of taking this term and multiplying it by a form of one, and multiplying this one by a form of one, we could just get a common denominator, right? Because notice our common denominator between these two terms would be basically both quantities, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say, I'm gonna start with the left side on this one, which is one over one minus sine theta plus one over one plus sine theta. So I'm writing it with some space on purpose. So if I want to add these two together, I need a common denominator. So I want to be able to write this one with the same denominator as this one, right? So my common denominator, I would have to have both a one minus sine theta and a one plus sine theta. So one minus sine theta, one plus sine theta, one minus sine theta, one plus sine theta. Okay, that's the denominator I want to end up with. So um, in order to do that, I have to multiply each one by the piece it's missing. So if I have a one minus sine theta and I want it to look like this, I need a one plus sine theta. So one plus sine theta over one plus sine theta, right? That's how I that's how I build up this denominator to what I want it to be. So that means my new numerator here, if I do one times one plus sine theta, I just get one plus sine theta. Now don't reduce here or you'll go back to what you started with. Now I wanna do the same thing on the next one. I need to multiply by whatever its denominator is missing. And this one is a one plus sine theta. So I already have that piece. So the piece I'm missing is the one minus sine theta. So one minus sine theta is what I'm gonna multiply on top and bottom. Because if I multiply by a form of one, it doesn't change the value, right? So when I do one times one minus sine theta, I get one minus sine theta. And on bottom, I get that difference of squares factored quantities that I was looking for. Okay. All right, so now that the denominators are the same, we can go ahead and just add a cross on the top. Or in other words, we can write this all over my common denominator. One minus sine theta, one plus sine theta. Okay, so I write it all as one. This term, I had a one plus sine theta, plus this one has a one minus sine theta. So there's a couple of things I can do. First, I see that I have a positive and negative sine theta. So I know those are gonna cancel out, which leaves me with a two on top, right? And then on bottom, I have these difference of squares quantities. So I wanna make sure that they're the ones that I need, that I'm not off by a sign, right, like the last time. So I'm looking for a one and a sign, one and a sign. So if I look at my Pythagorean identities, notice I do have quantities with a one and a sign, and it's a one plus sign and a one minus sign. I have a one plus sign and a one minus sign. So I don't even need to foil this out because it already looks exactly the way I need it to in order to replace it with cosine squared theta. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace this whole denominator with cosine squared theta. Okay. So this becomes cosine squared theta. Okay, I'm just gonna put here, this was an identity. A Pythagorean identity. So now here's what we have. This is what we're working towards. And it almost looks the same, right? I have the two and I know that cosine and secant are inverses. So I can write this as 
2 times 1 over cosine squared theta, right? And then 1 over cosine squared theta, I can rewrite as secant squared theta, which is, in fact, the right side, which means I have finished my proof. Hip, hip, hooray, right? All right, so let's look at another one. Actually, I'm going to let y'all try the last two, okay? So I want you to try number seven, and then on the next page, number eight. And we're not going to go over this one. I'm not going to worry about this one right now, okay? So y'all will go ahead and pause the video, try number seven and number eight, and then whenever you're done, or if you get stuck, unpause the video and we'll work through it, okay? All right, let's see how you did. So on the first one, just like the last one that we did, I see that I have two quantities down here that look almost the same. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the left side and just get a common denominator because my common denominator here would be one minus cosine x and one plus cosine x. So I wrote out the two terms that I have and I wanna write them both with a common denominator of one plus cosine and one minus cosine, right? So the way that I build up my denominator from what I have to what I want is I multiply on top and bottom by what my current denominator is missing. So this one is missing a one plus cosine x. So I'm gonna multiply that on top and bottom. So unlike the last one I did, the last one I did, we just had a, a, a numerator of one, right? But here we have another numerator. So when I multiply on the tops, I'm gonna to have two quantities to foil out, right? Same thing over here, this one's missing a one minus cosine x. So when I multiply that on top, I'll have to foil those two quantities. So I went ahead and wrote them, and then we just start foiling them out. When you foil the first two out, we should get one plus cosine x plus cosine x plus cosine squared x. When we foil the second ones out, we should get one minus cosine x minus cosine x plus cosine squared x. And you'll notice I have it in parentheses because we're subtracting that term. So whatever this whole thing ends up equaling, I wanna make sure that negative gets distributed to all of it, okay? And then on bottom, that common denominator that we were working towards, the one plus cosine x, one minus cosine x, that's our Pythagorean identity. So if we look back at that, one plus cosine x and one minus cosine x, that's actually an identity for sine squared x. So we're gonna go ahead and replace our one plus cosine, one minus cosine with sine squared x. So that's what our denominator looks like. And then on top, I went, in, I went ahead and combined the two cosine terms um, from each of the foilings, and I distributed the negative to all those terms. And once you do that, your cosine squared terms and your constant uh, terms of one and negative one should all cancel out. So that leaves us with four cosine x over sine squared x. And then we double check, excuse me, to see this is what we've worked our way down to. What do we want to end up with? So if I look at the right hand side, I have the four, right? I have that, but I need a cotangent and a cosecant. And right now I have sine and cosine. Well, sine and cosine I can use to write cotangent and cosecant. So I just need to divvy it up in a way that makes sense. So cotangent is cosine over sine, right? So if I take one of the sine squared terms and I just group it with that cosine, so I'm just gonna write the four out front and then I'm gonna separate this into two separate sine uh, factors. So the first one I'm gonna group with my cosine x and then the other one I'm just gonna leave um, as its own little sine x, right? So you agree if I multiplied this back out, I'd still get everything over sine squared, but I'm just separating it out. So now I can see that this cosine over sine becomes cotangent and my one over sine becomes cosecant. So again, when you're working this worksheet, make sure you're showing me these steps. You can't go straight from here to here. I wanna see that you knew how to separate it so that this actually turns out being cotangent, this actually ends up being cosecant, okay? All right, let's look at number eight. For number eight, this one looks kind of horrible, but the first thing that I notice is that I have a difference of two terms. 
And anytime I have a difference of two terms, I want to see if those two terms are perfect squares, which they are here, right? Sine to the fourth and cosine to the fourth are perfect squares. So if it's perfect squares and it's being subtracted, that's something that I can factor as the difference of squares, right? And I went ahead and wrote my difference of squares formula here. So I need to figure out what is the base that's being squared here, right? And what is the base that's being squared here? Because then I can plug it into my formula. So my two terms, I have sine to the fourth and, and cosine to the fourth. <clears throat> so if I'm trying to figure out what do I need to square to end up with sine to the fourth, well, it would have to be sine squared, right? And what would I have to square to end up with cosine to the fourth? It would have to be cosine squared. So these are the two bases that I can plug into my difference of squares formula. Or in other words, this left side, the numerator factors into sine squared alpha minus cosine squared alpha times sine squared alpha plus cosine squared alpha. And then those two quantities on top and bottom will cancel because they're identical, which leaves me just with sine squared alpha plus cosine squared alpha. And that is a Pythagorean identity. That's the, you sin, you confess, you're one with God, right? So that replaces to just one, which is exactly what I was working towards on the right side, right? Okay, so that is the end of section 5.2. You should now have your My Math Lab assignment to complete as well as the worksheet, okay? If you have any questions, please let me know.